Hey. Back in World War II, flushing poop was kind of an issue for submarines, since most had to be docked to get rid of their waste. This wasn't a problem for U-1206 though, since it had an innovative toilet that could be flushed at sea. No docking required. But, in typical German fashion, the toilet was over-engineered and too complex to use. This meant the crewmen had to be potty trained to use it and there were supervisors for every flush. This caused issues only 8 days into the sub's first patrol when its commander, Adolf Schlitt, got a bad case of the shamrock shitties and blew up the can. He couldn't figure out how to flush the toilet, so he called the poop soup to come and fix it. Unfortunately, the engineer only made things worse though. The guy must have zoned out during potty training because he turned the wrong valve. This mistake released a backflow of seawater and sewage into the submarine. But somehow, the gas released by Adolf's ass blast wasn't even the worst attack the crew had. When the toilet flooded, it damaged the batteries beneath it, and the mixture of sewage and seawater combined with the battery acid to make chlorine gas. So, with his vessel quickly filling up with water, poo-poo, and two types of lethal gas, Captain Schlitt made the call to surface the submarine. The crew popped up just off the coast of Scotland, where a British plane saw them almost immediately and began dropping bombs. These ended up being less lethal than the bomb Schlitt just dropped because they didn't kill anyone, but the flooding of the toilet did. Knowing he was about to be captured, Schlitt made the tough choice to scuttle his sub so the classified documents on board wouldn't be taken, and he, along with his crew, were soon captured, but not before three of them drowned. In his official report, Adolf Schittler tried to deny any involvement in the incident, since he said he was in the engine room when the leak happened. Sure, buddy. Surprisingly enough, though, the sinking of 1206 isn't even the worst failure by underwater racists. That title goes to the Confederates and the H.L. Hunley. This submarine was named after its inventor, Horace Lawson Hunley, who built it in Alabama in 1863. And, despite the bumpkin engineering, she was actually built pretty well. It required a crew of seven hicks to operate the hand crank propeller, plus a captain to steer. And with this fine piece of southern engineering, she could travel at just over seven kilometers an hour, so long as every man was cranking their shaft at max speed. <laughs> the Confederate leaders were interested in his submarine, and Horace was eager to claim the large bounty on Union ships, so the Hunley was shipped off to Charleston where it would be tested and prepared to fight. The first of these tests happened in August, and, by the Hunley standards, it actually went pretty well, only killing five of its crew. The sub was sitting at a dock, getting ready to leave, when the wake from another ship rolled over the open hatches. This caused the sub to quickly fill with water and sink to the bottom of the harbor, and, unfortunately, only the captain and two crewmen made it out alive. Most people would try to learn from this mistake and improve on the sub's design, but, Horace suffered from a severe learning disability, known as <clears throat> uh, being born in the South. This unfortunate condition meant he instead just continued with business as usual. The Confederates scooped up the submarine, dumped out the water and bodies, then just moved on to the second round of testing. Horace did make one change though. He decided to place himself as the captain, since according to him, the last crew was incompetent and he was the only one qualified to lead the ship. Only two months after the first accident, he scheduled a demonstration where he would show off the Hunley's abilities. He gathered a crowd of Confederate generals, soldiers, and any other inbred individual to watch as he performed his cool move. He was supposed to sail up to a parked Confederate ship, then dive under and come out on the other side. So, with the crowd hanging onto their seats and the relatives' genitals, Horace set off to execute his plan. He sailed up to the side of the ship, dove clean under it, and drowned. Yeah, that's it. The dude just fucking died. The sub never came back up. When the Hunley was eventually pulled out of the lake and drained for the second time, they found one of the ballast tanks had been left open. This means either Horace forgot to close the tank, or he lost his wrench and was unable to close it. Either way, Homeboy got himself and his seven crewmen killed. It was at this point, with the inventor dead and a dozen casualties without ever seeing combat, that the Confederate higher-ups decided the Hunley was ready for battle. They assembled a third crew and got ready to sink the Housatonic, which was blockading Charleston. Now, if you're still paying attention, you're probably wondering, how is the Hunley going to sink a ship if it has no weapons? Well, the original design had a floating bomb towed behind it using a long rope, but this was scrapped since it was too dangerous. Instead, the South's smoothest brains got together and came up with a safer weapon, bomb on a stick. 
They attached a long wooden rod to the front of the submarine and just slapped a bomb on it. With this innovative design and a new crew, the Hunley set off for its first real mission. Under the cover of darkness, they managed to get fairly close to the Housatonic before getting spotted by one of its crewmen. The dude tried to point it out to his captain, but was ignored, since according to him, it was actually just a log. What? You think that large submarine-shaped object traveling rapidly towards us while reflecting the moonlight off its metallic surface is a submarine? That's a log, dumbass. Well, it turns out his captain was wrong, because only a few minutes later, the big metal log was right up next to the ship, and by the time the rest of the crew realized and started pointlessly shooting at it, the Hunley was too close to be stopped. The bomb on a stick slammed into the side of the Housatonic and blew a massive hole in the ship. It took less than 5 minutes for it to sink, and when the chaos was over, out of 155 crew aboard, only 5 Union soldiers were dead. Unfortunately for our lovable little group of racists, they never got to celebrate, since the shockwave from the explosion killed everyone on board. And in total, at the end of her service, the Confederates racked up 26 kills using the submarine, with 21 of them being their own men. But despite having a mortality rate higher than the collective IQ of the South, the Hunley was actually a massive success, being the first submarine in history to sink a warship. Alright, so the next bit of dumb history that I want to talk about is the invasion of Kiska Island. This operation has since become one of the forgotten battles of World War II. And while a history nerd will probably say something like, Um, Kiska's only forgotten about because there are more important things in the war, like D-Day or the nuking of Japan. That's baloney and a conspiracy. I think the battle was such a train wreck, the government wants you to forget. So during World War II, Japan and America had some minor beef, which only got worse when Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. The first island they picked was Kiska, and the invasion was a cakewalk, since the only people on it were 10 weather dudes and a dog named Explosion. So, when the Japanese rolled up with 500 soldiers, they took the island pretty easily. Two of the weather dudes were killed, Seven were captured, and one managed to run away and live off the island. But after 50 days of sleeping outside and his only meal being someone's girlfriend, he surrendered and was captured with the rest. Now, you're probably wondering what happened to Explosion, but don't worry. The Japanese took her in as one of their own and she became an honorary member of the Japanese army, spending her days trading Pokemon cards, eating sushi with the boys, and committing war crimes. Anyways, after the invasion, Japan was turning Kiska into a military base while the US was performing one of their favorite activities, bombing the Japanese. And this constant bombardment made the Japanese realize Kiska sucked ass and wasn't worth dying for. So, just over a year after taking it, they booby-trapped it and snuck out under the cover of darkness. The Americans didn't realize they'd left though, so two weeks later a full invasion with over 34,000 American and Canadian troops was launched. Things immediately went wrong since Kiska has incredibly thick and almost constant fog. One of the Canadians saw a silhouette in the distance and opened fire, causing a full-on shootout. At some point, the gunfire stopped and the fog cleared, revealing what had happened. My fellow Canadians gunned down 28 Americans and lost only 4 of their own. Let's go boys. Somehow, the invasion got even worse from here since Japan's booby traps killed another 4 soldiers. This, paired with the shootout, Bad weather and poor visibility had every soldier on edge. As they would move slowly through the island, they were so jumpy they'd shoot at anything that looked vaguely Japanese. I need the max win. <laughs> also during the invasion, one of the US's warships, the Abner Reed, ran into a mine. This killed another 71 soldiers and wounded a whole bunch more. By the end of it, Canada and the US had spent days invading Kiska fighting no one, but still losing almost 100 soldiers and wounding 200 more. It wasn't all for nothing though, since this invasion earned them the best Wikipedia battle summary that I've ever seen. Alright, so just like all my videos, I'm ending this one with a week-long methamphetamine bender. Only this time, I'm not the one passed out in a ditch, it's Finland's cracked out soldier, Aimo Koivunen. Back in 1944, as part of the Continuation War, Aimo and his ski patrol were deep behind enemy lines when they were ambushed by Soviets. They tried to escape, but the knee-deep snow and ski leader moving slower than Joe Biden made it impossible for them to shake the Russians. Aimo thought he could do a better job, so he skied his way to the front to lead. But not long after, he was getting pretty tired and he knew that he and his buddies would soon be captured. Luckily for him though, he had his group's entire supply of Pervitin, which is just method pill form. Normally he was against using drugs, but he knew taking a pill was better than getting sent to the gulags, so he decided, eh, fuck it. 
The only issue was, Imo was wearing big ass mitts which gave him the finger dexterity of an Iranian thief. So, instead of pulling out just one pill, Imo dumped out the whole bottle and took enough meth for 30 soldiers, or one Detroit resident. This worked out for a while since Imo started skiing so fast they lost the Soviets, but he also started tripping balls and eventually blacked out. When Imo woke up, he looked around and realized, damn, I'm all alone. And when he checked his supplies, he thought, ugh, bastards took all my Imo. It seems like at some point, his friends took his knife and ammo before he took off. This was probably a safe bet, since they just watched him tweak harder than my boss when he finds out I skip work to make these dog-ass videos. Anyways, being abandoned didn't bother Imo too much, since he saw smoke on the horizon, which he thought was from his friend's camp. He started skiing towards it, but once he got close enough, he realized, yet again, he was tweaking. The camp was actually from the same group that was chasing him earlier, but by the time he noticed, he was too close to stop. So, he just went straight through it. They did try to chase him for a while, but since Imo had a turbo boost, they just couldn't keep up. With the power of meth, he continued to ski in any random direction for days straight, hallucinating along the way. He got into a fight to the death with a wolverine that turned out to be a log. After that, he won a gunfight with a tree branch, then spent an entire night chasing the North Star, thinking it was the light from a campfire. And, to top it all off, Imo made a tweaker delicacy, pine bud soup. His bender continued until he eventually found an unlocked cabin, which he didn't hallucinate. This was the first shelter he'd had in days, so he decided to camp out here for the night. Unfortunately, this didn't last very long though, since his inner tweaker took over and forced him to commit arson. Imo decided to make a fire to warm himself up, but instead of using the fireplace, he just made it on the floor. The fire quickly spread to the whole cabin and Imo had to get out of there before it all went up in flames. The next day, things somehow got worse when he stumbled upon an abandoned German outpost. Imo was blissfully skiing right up to the front door, where he then stepped on a landmine. This blew up his left foot, and apparently the back of his pants, so he took the natural next step of crawling into a ditch and waiting to die. But unbeknownst to him, he had taken enough meth to legally become God and was therefore unkillable. According to him, he sat in the ditch for days, but eventually locked in and went back to the outpost. Turns out, this was actually worse than just waiting to die, since the front door was also booby-trapped. So, when Imo opened it, he was blown up and sent back to the ditch yet again. This time, he decided not to give up though. He made a campfire and clubbed a Siberian Jay to death using his ski pole. But, for some reason, he chose not to cook it and just ate the thing raw. This tweaker meal gave him enough energy to survive for a couple more days before a patrol eventually found the outpost. Imo heard them speaking and realized the gibberish coming out of their mouths was Finnish. This was the first time in weeks he'd seen a friendly face, so he eagerly called them over to his ditch. Unfortunately, he forgot to warn them about the mines though, so one of the men was blown up and also needed to be rescued. The patrol could only take one of them and obviously picked their friend over the tweaking ditch troll that had just blown himself up twice. This means he had to wait around until they came back, but before they could, he was spotted by a plane and rescued. Imo was brought back to a hospital where the doctors told him he was missing for two weeks and had skied over 400 kilometers since his group last saw him. At this point, he weighed in at only 95 pounds and had maintained a heart rate of 200 beats per minute for the whole two weeks he was blasted on meth. Shortly thereafter, Imo immigrated to Michigan and lived a life on the streets, stripping copper from wires, stealing beer cans from recycling bins, and turning tricks to fund his addiction. And, tragically, he passed away just a few months later. Nah, I'm just kidding. He was fine. Homeboy somehow made it to the ripe old age of 71, and while he himself is basically the only source for this story, based on his pictures, I absolutely believe him. Alright, so that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed. Remember to do all the YouTuber stuff. Like, comment, subscribe, watch my other stuff so YouTube pays me more money. Or don't. Either way, I'm going back into cryostasis. I'll see you next month. Bye.